Hi, I'm Owen from REST Australia. Thanks for tuning in to the REST Network. Before we get into today's show, there are a few things we have to go over. Firstly, what you're about to hear and see is limited to general information only. It's not personal financial advice like you get from a financial planner. Also, it's important to remember that past performance is not indicative of future performance. That means that anything that's happened in the past, or we say today, is not necessarily going to reflect what happens in the future. Lastly, please consider that any of the guests or myself are featuring on this program may have a financial interest in some of the products or shares mentioned. That's enough from me. I hope you enjoyed today's program. Tom, welcome to the Australian Investors Podcast. Thanks, Owen. Great to, great to be on and back chatting with you. Yeah, we uh, had a bit of a false start, didn't we? We did. We recorded this in person and then there was a catastrophic failure to a piece of hardware all on my end. It was a fault on my end and we are here again. So doing it remotely, mate, it's always good to chat. Um, for folks that haven't heard you talk before, I mean, a lot of them would have because we've spoken on our Self Wealth Live and on the live show quite a bit and you do a lot of presentations and you know, you and Cam and the team at BetaShares write a lot. Can you tell us what you do day to day at BetaShares? Yeah. So initially, I joined the business about four years ago now. Um, when I first joined, I was actually in a, I was in more of a sales role. So I worked in our wealth management or broker sales team. Um, so that was you know outbound sales, dealing with clients, talking through our product set, uh, and leveraging a lot of the work done by others in terms of what to sell and the research we put out. More recently, though, in the past eight months, or for the most part of this year, uh, I've moved into an investment strategy role. Um, so for those familiar with Cam as well, he's, he's who I work under. And essentially, our team now looks to put together a lot of the research, a lot of the content, a lot of the ideas that go out to the market that our sales team take out. So if you think of like a traditional analyst role, your, your traditional analysts are more focusing on a company-specific level right? That's your, your active guys or you're um, looking for stock-specific stories. Since we're an ETF fund manager, our role's a little different. We still do similar research, but more on a macro level yeah. uh, because you know, ETFs are great macro trading tools. You, you're, you're really trading you know, a larger region or a sector. So it means we, we kind of take a step back from the individual company level a lot of the time and looking at the bigger trends going on, on globally. Mm. Did you always want to get into this? Like, Did you always want to get into investing? I did. I did always want to get into to finance and investing. But interestingly, I thought when I was, um, you know, particularly when I was finishing school and going to university, I had this perception that it would be too, you know, it was kind of perceived as like quite one of the hardest courses you could do at university. Um, I did. I honestly didn't know if I'd be able, be able, be able to scratch to it. So I did um, commerce with economics and accounting instead. Um, it's actually quite a few accountants in the family. So I pursued that originally. I uh, did some audit accounting over in London for a year, but all I learned is I didn't really want to do accounting. It wasn't for me. It's kind of more backward looking. I still had this interest in finance. I, I was starting to learn more about it, you know, personally outside of formalized study. Uh, and then somewhat by chance, I um, stumbled across beta shares and had a few copies and a few interviews and I managed to get the role. And I've been um, yeah, pretty, pretty happy ever since, I think. Mm -hmm. you know, and you find a role and it, it really feels like it suits and fits. I really enjoy the work we do. It's, um, yeah, it's been great. It feels like I land in the, in the right spot. Um, so in your role, we were just talking off air about this and we've spoken about it before, is like beta shares, people know beta shares. Um, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, beta shares is the largest issuer of ETFs in the country by number of ETFs mm -hmm. and one of the biggest by total funds under management. Um, I guess the thing is like, what you do, like you come here and you speak with us, but you also do a lot of research, you write a lot, you communicate internally as a team, you speak with advisors, you basically speak with all different types of investors that would be interested in understanding how these strategies come together, um, which I can imagine is a lot. So how do you kind of like spend your time and your day consuming information and kind of like synthesizing what's important? Like it, investors get kind of, I guess, overwhelmed just by reading like one page of the AFR or Bloomberg mm -hmm. or whatever, but how do you kind of condense that and make it efficient for you and understand what's really important? Yeah, it's 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 really hard. It's like a big challenge today. It's like we've 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 come from a place where it was you know harder to consume information before before the internet, before these resources, and now there's so much information out there. It's almost like it's it's hard to know how to consume information. You feel like you need to read everything, get all these opinions to try um, you know better your own understanding. 
What I found though is um, on some good advice as well for some people who've been in the industry for a while, I started really broad. Like I started with, you know, getting information from from everywhere I could. Uh, like subscribe to all the, you know, finance newsletters. Would you know, got to scout the AFR, Bloomberg, uh, the Wall Street Journal, uh, Financial Times, and started really broad. And then over time, have really condensed what I read and what I look at to to help. Um, I, I tend to find the, you know, the different news outlets I preferred for different types of stories. The particular particular writers I really like because there's. You know, some really good writers in the market, like um, one that comes to my Matt Levine, who who does um, who writes mm. for Bloomberg. He's got a daily or every other day email, and he'll just cover the you know big topics going on, but in quite a deep dive kind of way. Um, and so that's been really important to help uh, my mm. own research understanding, because you know we've got access to to things like Goldman Sachs and, and JP Morgan research, so even. You know, broader range, um, but I know now if I'm looking for a particular you know piece on technology, I know the you know the researchers I like to look for that. So I think it's pretty daunting at first, but that's a pretty important process to you know, take a lot in at first, understand that's not achievable over the long term, and kind of find out you know where you like the information mm. uh, and do it that way. Yeah, I know a lot of investors really do struggle with um, kind of just understanding who's who in the zoo and what's important. And like we get sucked into sensationalist headlines or we just, because it's an attention economy, we think to ourselves, well, you know, maybe I can just get by by reading the headlines and get the gist of the article or something like that. But um, I think more and more people need to become discerning with the source and then the content as well and their ability to, their particular author's ability to speak on that. Uh, a little while ago now, you and I caught up. Uh, it's actually virtually as well. And we did a, um, as part of the mini series that we did on the self wealth live program. Mm -hmm. And you brought some amazing charts and everyone was kind of stoked that you did because it was, it really illustrated the point of what uh, we were talking about in that session. So I'll refer back anyone back to that um, to get a hold of these charts, but also some of the articles and things that you've penned over time. Uh, one of the questions we speak about a lot, and we do this both on weekends and during our weekday show, is this idea of having the right like asset allocation. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people who are non-finance people get quite, I guess, I guess, put off by this idea of trying to think about what a risk profile actually means, about how do you actually structure a portfolio. And of course, they should. we can refer them to a financial advisor, of course. But can you talk at a high level about how people can think about asset allocation and this idea. Maybe we could explore the idea of using ETFs to do that as well. Yeah, no, it's a really good and really important question. I think you're right. I think particularly for people who are, you know, we're, we're, we're in the industry, we understand it, you know, we, we know mm. um, the key concepts. But if you're just getting in, you just want to, you know, do your own, go on your own investment journey, um, it can be really daunting hearing asset allocation, knowing there's, Australian equities, international equities, fixed income, emerging market, it just sounds all a bit too much and, and it can be daunting. I think what's really important is to take a step back from all of that at first um, and just understand why are you investing? Um, because the answer is, there's, there's no right or wrong answer and the answer is different for everyone. Um, if you, you know, you could be a young accumulator, you could be, you know, instead of putting your savings in a bank account, you want to start putting them in an ETF and this is to save up money over the next I don't know, 20 years to try and buy a house. So your, your goals are pretty, you know, you've got long-term goals. You've probably got a higher risk appetite than some other investors. Mm. Um, and so just understanding that you can say, okay, so longer term, higher risk appetite. And then you can think, you know, or learn a bit more about what different asset classes do. And most people have a, a fairly uh, intuitive sense uh, initially. Most people know, okay, cash and, and fixed income, they tend to be more defensive, more income orientated. Equities tend to be more growthy. Mm. Um, and just staying at a really high level um, can be really good for understanding. Because obviously on the on the flip side, like a you know retiree investor, for instance, could have a large sum of money. Um, instead of trying to grow that, they just want to live off that. So two very different goals. Um, and by understanding those goals and also uh, understanding the risks you face um, personally from the goals you're trying to achieve um, and from investing can really help set a framework before you even think about the individual asset classes and, and asset allocation itself. Um, mm. Yeah, and once you understand that and then you can start to dig a bit deeper uh, and try and you know learn from different places. Okay, so I know equities are typically more growthy. Um, what does that mean? What is that role in the portfolio? 
um, how, how, how much that can be exposed to. And then once you figure that out, okay, so fixed income and bonds, what, what role does that play? So I'd, I'd separate it out and then let it come all together at the end is, would be my you know, main advice. Mm. I like the idea of like stepping back and um, thinking generally, you know, in terms of the timeline. I think timeline's hugely important. Um, and you, you'd know this from the CFA curriculum or just finance theory, how, uh, how complicated the idea of taking risk, appetite for risk, risk tolerance, all these different words we use to just identify um, pretty simple concepts at the end of the day, like how much do you have in growth assets and how much do you have in defensive assets? Um, and I think if people want to go back and refer to the chart, I think you did a really neat thing about like when people say they are um, – you know, high risk, what that actually looks like in a portfolio. Well, you're going to have more of those growth assets than defensive assets and so on and so forth. And as you approach retirement, maybe you have less and you still need some growth, but not as much, of course. Um, another thing that people, this is probably more, you know, a more topical thing because we're going to talk about AI and these types of things in just a moment and also, you know, the success of uh, particularly US tech stocks. Mm-hmm. Um, but one of the things that people often succumb to uh, other kind of litany of behavioral biases. And um, one of the things you brought up when we spoke previously was this idea of the behavior gap. And Mm. I find a lot of people misunderstand what we mean by biases and how they can actually play out in practice. And probably the most, one of the most obvious ones for me is something that you touched on there, which was this idea that you can be invested in an ETF, say you're invested in a beta shares, like the NDQ ETF, just to Mm. use an example. Um, You could be invested in one of those. And it does really well, but you don't get that return over five years because you've traded in and out. You've come up with a view of the market and what you thought would happen and it didn't happen. And so there's a massive gap between the performance of the fund and your actual return. Can you talk a little bit about how you think investors can go about avoiding those kind of like um, erratic emotions of like the fear of missing out or FOMO as the kids yeah. call it these days? And maybe the, the flip side of that, which is like the despair that people get when they experience a bit of volatility. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's a another great question. I mean, it's important. Um, I kind of learned this lesson just by through mistakes. Really, I think it's <laughs> pretty common uh, in you know in a, in a new investor's journey. Um, I think it's fortuitous as well, particularly if you start at a younger age investing. You know, the amounts you're investing initially are probably more insignificant p- compared to what you'd be investing later in life. So it's kind of a great time to learn these lessons. Um, mm. When I started investing, you know, I was looking for the you know, penny stocks that would grow by 1,000%, um, trading in and out, trying to time the market. And I learned very quickly <laughs> that um, if I just held, as you mentioned, uh, our NASDAQ 100 ETF or even, let's say, a mix of that and an Australia 200 ETF. So just really broad markets, exposures that are just giving you market cap, track market, low cost. Uh, I would have outperformed my penny stock portfolio quite handsomely, and hmm. not necessarily because the you know A two hundred or or Nasdaq shot the lights out, which actually to be fair, Nasdaq even for a index fund, I think it's what, returned 20, 20 plus percent per annum over the past ten years. That kind of has shot the lights out, but it's more <laughs> not holding the stuff that that does really poorly. Um, and I think it's almost a lesson you have to you have to learn because it's so hard as a new investor if you. You know, you, you say you're real growth orientated and you really want to achieve really strong returns and you see, you know, cryptocurrencies returning 50% in a day. Well, h- how are you going to avoid not doing that? Um, if you've got more self-control than me and you're better at, at listening and learning, you, you can, from, from the start, really focus on diversification. And you know what? Still invest in those things, but, but a much smaller portion of your total portfolio because you, then you can still experience what goes on there, but you'd be much less impacted. And it's not to say... You can't do great research and you can't, um, you know, get long-term growth from those positions potentially. It's just to say a lot of the research, a lot of the study and a lot of, you know, what we've actually found out from investing like you you and me is that the bulk of your portfolio, if you put it in low-cost, passive, well-diversified ETFs, um, you're going to be probably much better placed over the long term. Mm. Um, Yeah. Yeah, well, well, I don't know about you, but I've been studying – this thing called investing for a very, very long time. And um, I, I went through a similar journey to you and I did have to experience it myself. But if like, if we could, I think of our purpose as a business at RASC to just kind of like to fast track people through that kind of humility curve to go up and then down the other side mm-hmm. pretty quickly and figure out that, you know what? Yeah, sure. You can try those things, but keep them small and keep them contained 
because this is coming from, and I know you, this is the case with you, you've been pe- people that have been doing it for over a decade and we're saying this is probably how we would start. Um, and so kind of it's like learn from the mistakes of others if you can. Yeah. Um, so the, the, the person who has uh, no master has a fool for a master because you kind of got to figure it out yourself. Um, speaking of one thing that is like capturing imaginations and maybe – I'm curious to hear your perspective on this is maybe capturing too much of people's imaginations is the idea of AI or artificial intelligence. Mm-hmm. Basically the only thing that people have wanted to speak about when you think about technology companies in 2023, mm-hmm. the rise of uh, open AI, the rise of Google Bard and, you know, generative language models. Do you think that's hype like for investors or do you think that we're in this phase where it is actually creating real value yeah i think i think there's there's a bit of both and you got you know such exciting stories like when you know chat gbt was announced of in december last year you're, you're always going to have some hype around it uh, it's, it's natural in investing but i do also think and it, it's there's been a string over the past let's say decade of these you know new technology related areas, things like, you know, cloud computing uh, a few years ago, and even now, actually, if you look at the um, results coming out from your, your companies like Microsoft and your big tech, it's still, you know, cloud computing, that trend, which is, you know, let's say five years ago, might have been similar to AI, and there's a lot of development going on, it was, a, it was a great concept. And now you're seeing, I think it's about 40, 40 plus percent of Microsoft's revenue this year was from cloud computing. Mm-hmm. Um, so we, we do we have seen the translation of some of these, but when we talk about AI itself, um, obviously, as I mentioned, it you know kind of popped up into the public sphere in December. These companies, though, they've been putting some serious research and development um, spending into these areas for about the better part of almost seven, eight years now. Like some of the ones you mentioned, OpenAI, I think they started back in 2015 or, or 2016. Uh, Google started investing in the area about five, six years ago. So I think what we're starting to see now is a translation of some of that research into some real-life applications, uh, and that's when we do start seeing the, the value out. I think you know, the most obvious area that we're going to see first is just through um, uh, business efficiencies, you know, Microsoft integrating AI into all their tools, which they're, which they're doing at the moment, will we'll create real efficiencies. And there are even, you know, that that's kind of the... The big end of town, right? I've just I've just talked about. There are even you know more pure play companies, so companies that don't have as diverse a revenue stream as those mega cap companies is, is kind of what I mean when I say pure play. They focus more specifically on AI. Um, like a fairly well known one uh, to to people in the industry, maybe not to others, is is a company called C three AI. Mm-hmm. They've been in the media quite a lot as well. But they what they do they they've spent a number of years just creating business software with AI. They can come and apply to a business to try and really help efficiencies. Um, they've got some great, great stories and case studies of, of companies they've worked with uh, to, to save into the millions of dollars per year just through better processes. Um, so I think the real the real value add is there. Um, but, yeah, as we're in the early stage, there's going to be noise as well, um, right? Mm-hmm. There's going to be hype and noise alongside that that value add. So I guess it's a you know, kind of a, a conclusion to all that. It's really important then. Um, and we talk about this a lot with ETFs and with thematic investing in particular. You know, it's our view it's really important to be fairly well diversified in these spaces. You know, it can be really hard to pick an individual winner. Like if, let's say you picked OpenAI as your, you know, they're obviously a private company, but as an example, let's say you had picked them, thought they were a winner, were able to buy some stocks in them or, or get exposure. Uh, and then it looks like it's been backflipped now, but then imagine the board fires their CEO and 505 mm. employees leave. The next week, yeah, you know, if that's the if that's the bet you took uh, on on your AI company, you know, you 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 got really significant stock specific risk there. Whereas if you use something like we've got a um, RBTZ ETF, so Global Robotics and Artificial Intelligence, um, so it's got a bit of both in there, um, and that covers you know a whole suite of pure play companies in AI. So you're not taking such a specific individual bet. You're not taking on as much risk. Um, mm. And I think in the early days for those growth style industries, it makes so much sense. I encourage anyone that um, even if you're not an ETF investor, for whatever reason, if you're just looking at uh, you know these industries and thinking, wow, one of the things you can do is you can just head straight to the BDS website and look at the companies that are inside and see and get a list of companies that you can go and research. And you might conclude, well, of the you know however many companies that say you research 10 of them, you go, well, I think this one might be the winner. 
but I could be wrong about that because it's so it's moving so fast, it changes so quickly. Mm-hmm. Maybe I could have the core and the satellite exposure within that theme as well. So I could have my ETF as the core, but then also pick you know four or five companies with smaller positions. And I think that's like a valid thing that people probably haven't got used to yet. Is like you can have a view with an ETF, but you can have and you can have a view on a theme. But there are multiple ways to play it, but you can still apply the core and satellite approach to it. One of the things that I guess people are wondering, and this is more like the technology side of me, mate, is like the rise of like cybercrime. Mm. We've seen a lot of privacy breaches in recent years. You see a lot of cyber attacks after geopolitical events. Um, you know, all like it's impacted everyone here in Australia basically as well, whether it's a healthcare system in recent years, telecommunications. You know, there's heaps of examples around this. And people see that AI as a great tool also gives rise to new threats. And, uh, you know, you guys offer a cybersecurity ETF. So can you tell us a little bit more about how that theme kind of plays out? Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of work going on in that space. To your point, um, I've forgotten the exact website name, but if you if you Google significant cyber events or threats, there's a website that records, you know, what they classify as significant events. So it's like a breach of more than a certain amount of dollars or, or involves the government. And it's quite terrifying. You go on there and in the past four or five years, there's like, you know, there's more, there's like 20 of these per month now. Um, and you read what's going on, you're like, oh my God, that's 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 pretty terrifying. Mm. Um, so it's been really important in the cybersecurity industry. So there's two halves to it, right? There's the cyber criminals who've got a lot more tools now to use. Um, it was CrowdStrike, uh, who's a big cybersecurity player, and they had their you know team of cybersecurity experts carry out a fairly sophisticated hack purely purely using Chat GPT. Uh, mm. Got it to write the convincing phishing email, write the malware, uh, send it off. So just to demonstrate how much more accessible these things are now, uh, and then also you know to demonstrate why it's so important to you know partner with a cybersecurity company because on the other end of things, they're also using AI. Um, to help protect against these threats, um, it's 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 an industry where and it's a great example of where you know using those specialist companies has become so important. If you're an individual company, um, the majority of companies a wouldn't have the scale or expertise to 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 run an in-house cybersecurity team with all the threats that are out there now. So using mm-hmm. you know outsourcing some of this cybersecurity to an expert like CrowdStrike, um, and you mentioned so we've got our cybersecurity ETF hack, which which has the you know largest cybersecurity companies in the world. But it's always been like this umbrella industry and technology. Whenever we see, you know, I'll use a cloud computing example again or, or EVs, as the world becomes more accessible through the internet of things, um, there's just a growing need for cybersecurity. And what's really good is every every quarter, Morgan Stanley, they put out a CIO survey, so interviewing CEOs of, of, of all the largest companies saying, what are you spending on? What are you not spending on? What are you cutting your spending on? Um, and ever since I started looking at it for the past three, four years, the top of the spending is cybersecurity, top hmm. of spending growth cybersecurity. And the third one, which is interesting and, and, and relevant in this market is if we see you know tougher economic times, if we see a recession, what are you least likely to cut spending on? And once again, cybersecurity is number one there. So it is a really good umbrella industry. It's almost like insurance across all, all your other technology um, technology industries. So it's one, um, yeah, we're still mm. seeing lots of relevance and, and interest in. Mm. It's uh, interesting when you were saying that. I was thinking about, I sent an email to our, a sec- segment of our community just this week and um, some people thought that there might be like someone impersonating us. Mm. Um, and it just gives you a sense of like how disruptive these things can be without even being disruptive like just the yeah. fear of it alone is enough to drive people to make those types of decisions whether you're just consuming content or information or services online um, versus someone that's making the big calls like the CEOs and CIOs who have to make these decisions about how they secure their business and what have you um, you mentioned earlier on that like the the Nasdaq in particular has probably like shot the lights out it's fair to say it's like in terms of like the performance of just an index fund mm. of the 100 companies on the NASDAQ, um, it has really, really like just been exceptional over a long period of time. But then if we look at like, say, some of like the Asian 
companies. Um, we probably haven't seen that, at least in recent years, it's fair to say, we haven't seen that yet. They had so much promise. Um, how do you juxtapose those two things, I guess? Yeah, it's really, it's been an interesting discussion. We've had this discussion with a lot of a lot of clients as well, because to, to your point, it was two or th- three years ago, three years ago, uh, our, we've got our beta shares, Asia Technology Tigers ETF, Asia. That was the best performing ETF in Australia. It, mm, it, I remember that. Yeah. It was uh, like 67% it returned in one year. Um, and what what's in there is a lot of these companies that are very similar to the technology companies we're familiar with, like Microsoft, Amazon, Apple, um, but their Chinese counterparts um, because in, in mainland China, a lot of people don't have access to those those Western technology companies. Um, we know how how big and how fast growing, and how uh, and the, the population and the demographics of China. So there's a huge story there around a huge booming middle class that are becoming more technologically uh, advanced and and utilizing these websites more and more. Um, actually, and getting more access to the internet. It was something like five years ago. The actual um, there's still about twenty percent of the population in China that hadn't had access to the internet. So it's a huge. Whereas in the Western world, it was like ninety nine percent. Hmm. So it's a huge opportunity there. Um, we saw some growth and then we saw a few years of, yeah, really severe underperformance, particularly on a relative basis to the US. I mean, China's obviously going through its own quite significant structural changes, going from what you'd call probably a more traditional emerging uh, economy and trying to shift that into becoming um, more internally driven, less export orientated Um and I think a big part of it, when we started to keeping those legs down the market, was just how the regulatory landscape over there has worked. Um, a lot of the changes they put in place for big tech, a lot of these anti-competition rules, um, when they'll hand out record fines to companies like Alibaba, who are like um, who are like the Amazon in China, and actually they had an IPO, a company mm. called Ant, a spin-off, or not a spin-off, sorry, just a financial services company within their arm, which was going to IPO, it was going to be the biggest IPO ever. And about a week before the IPO, the, the government came out and just quashed it and just said, you have to reclassify your company a different way. And so just, you know, these pretty late um, and pretty, yeah, big swinging regulations that took a lot of the market by shock, which is, I think, a really big difference between the US and China and the way business and, and government works done. Whereas in the US, they're making similar laws, similar anti-competition laws to, to make sure there isn't this huge monopolistic um, control by those large tech companies. They do it in a much more formalized, much more um, you know drawn out way, so mm-hmm. investors are aware of it, and it feels nicer. Whereas in China, it's just overnight they can change their mind. They you know ban things like gaming or gaming for you know certain hours for kids, and they they ban on they ban making money from online tutoring. So I think this is big burgeoning blows and the the uncertainty. It's almost like an uncertainty premium. Um, that you're you're paying to, to invest in China uh, has hurt those companies quite a lot. We have seen from the lows stronger performance this year, but then again, not compared to the Nasdaq. So I think mm. it's just that different landscape and and the structural changes they're going through and that uncertainty, which has always made China a harder place harder place to invest. Um, we've seen it time and time again. Where it's a great story because these companies also they. You know, trade on a relatively cheap basis compared to the US, um, but have always just you know found found those issues along the way. But do you think like so? That's interesting. The uncertainty premium that you put it that way, like the uncertainty of the government changing things dramatically, necessitates a lower valuation, say lower price earnings ratios, lower whatever. Um, do you think that that could reverse like? Do you think that the growth that they're experiencing, because they are growing, a lot of them, yeah. um, do you think that at least the, maybe not the geopolitical cycle, that's pretty difficult to predict, but do you think that it still has a place in portfolios then? I think it does. Uh, again, it depends on the investor. I mean, I, I personally uh, have some age. I bought some when things had sold off quite a bit because it is such a compelling story. Like, you know, these huge tech companies that have pretty much 100% capture of their market, which is a huge market. Mm. Um, they're trading on really low valuations compared to the US counterparts. Um, 
you're seeing a bit more. That was that was over the last few years. You're seeing a bit more regulatory willingness from the government to to try and aid these companies because ultimately, if 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 what I'm saying is right, and the the government's trying to change the way they grow and looking for a more internal growth and more technological driven growth, they're going to need to rely on these companies to an extent. Uh, they do want to foster innovation through these anti-competition laws, which is really healthy. They also will rely on these large companies, just like the, the US market has for growth. Um, you know, if you take out the Magnificent Seven, the, those seven large technology companies in the US out of the S&P 500, the index, would be, the index would be flat this year. Instead, it's up something like 20%. So, you know, you can still rely on those companies to foster growth. So I think ultimately, mm-hmm. as you said, it's impossible to, to say, but I think ultimately, you know, there, there will be a fine-tuning of the system there, but the opportunity is still really compelling. Mm. Um, and so probably one of those positions, as we talked about, you know, probably not your your whole international equity portfolio being there, but if it's something you're interested in and, and do some research in and, and, and believe there's a good opportunity there, definitely like a, you know, a satellite position or you know, a part of the emerging markets asset allocation, um, mm. it fits in there nicely. I was going to, yes, it's just like there's this kind of changing dynamic of emerging markets too, right? Like decades ago, it was all about Russian oligarchs and um, South American miners and really, the composition of the EM index has changed. Where now it's you know the big tech names of Asia really dominate it. Um, mm. And so, to get that high growth that you've typically got from emerging markets, you've got to be aware of those changes. And and um, yeah, so I think it still does play that role. Yeah, because that was going to that's like a good segue into the next question, which was like about the performance of the Nasdaq. Like if you could think about how that's performed so exceptionally well over a long period of time, and to an extent the S and P five hundred, um, mm-hmm. mainly driven as you said by big tech companies, the evolution of the mm-hmm. the indices towards hyper-scalable, hyper-consistent growth technology companies. Um, I guess the question that people have is like, how has that happened? Could it continue? Yeah, it's funny. It's funny to use that word evolution. So just this week or last week in our newsletter, um, I put out a, a piece on the evolution of the NASDAQ 100, which right. – if, if this is interested, you can go to our you know, beta shares website and just go to the insights section. And it's talking about, um, you know, the NASDAQ 100s come from a place where if we think back 20 years, so the dot-com bubble, a lot of fairly unprofitable tech names and there was, you know, the, the PE ratio of the NASDAQ up to 200 times. So it's huge hype, huge growth, not backed up by much. And I guess one question we get, or one, the only pushback we get really on the NASDAQ is how has it grown so much? How can it continue to grow so much? Um, mm. We've seen that. And what's really interesting, when you break down the growth of the NASDAQ over the last 20 years, um, you actually find that the PE is contracted. So this was after the, the crash, but the PE is actually contracted over that time, even though the price has performed so well because we've seen such extraordinary mm. earnings growth. Um, and so doing some work in NASDAQ as well, actually, that's some, some great data about where this is coming from. And it's, it's, a lot of it's to do with the really successful research and development these companies do. And it's quite extraordinary the amount of money these companies spend in research and development. So if you compare the NASDAQ 100 to the S&P 500, excluding NASDAQ names for this example, yeah. the NASDAQ companies spend about eight times more on research and, and development as a percentage of sales, which hmm. is quite quite remarkable. Um, and is. so a lot of that research and development is into these areas that we've, we've touched on a bit, but things like, you know, decades ago it was um, cloud computing. There's actually, as part of this article, I, I did some, I did a part on Microsoft um, and I found a great article in, it was in Bloomberg. Um, essentially the title was something like, you know, Microsoft, how much longer will be around? It'll be dead in a few years' time. It was seen as this dinosaur company. Um, they spent 90% of their R&D spend, which was, I think, fifth in the world that year, on this new cloud computing division. And people hmm. were like, geez, these guys, I don't know, they might have lost the plot a bit. And sure enough, now they're one of the most profitable companies in the world because of that. Um, and we're seeing that play out again in um, hmm. in AI. So I think, and what's um, what's really interesting too in the past, you're probably familiar with the investors, sorry, the innovators dilemma. Yeah. Talking about when there's a big company with really great success, um, typically there's a fear to disrupt themselves because if they disrupt themselves, they're hurting their current successful revenue line. Um, and what we've seen with these new technology companies, these Magnificent Seven, they're not scared to disrupt themselves. Um, they're not scared to um, innovate, um, to eat away their current revenue growth, to foster future revenue growth. 
uh, which is a difference we've seen compared to, to years of, of companies gone by. Mm. I guess um, it's kind of like that self-fulfilling loop is that they're massive, so they can afford to spend on these innovative products and solutions to big problems, whereas companies that will never get to that level um, will never have the opportunity to hire those people to solve those problems at scale. Whereas in the past, like a lot of the problems that we solved as countries and as states was driven by the governments because no one else could afford to do it. So things like railways and things like that, like the government would have to lay the foundations. Yeah. Yeah, you know, innovation in space and places like this where you have organisations like NASA being funded by the government and now it's mm. been replaced. Whereas now we're seeing the big breakthroughs come from the corporate side of things where um, they have just unbelievable budgets because they have profitability uh, in their core businesses and they can spend. Um, there's one more area that I kind of want to touch on with you, which is this idea of psychology. We did mention it before, but um, one of the things that we're seeing take shape is more people than ever are investing in ETFs. And in here in Australia, we had Elon on the show recently, uh, co-founder of BitShares. And he told, I can't remember the fact off the top of my head, of something like, I could be wrong, Tom, it was something like 25% of um, in new investment money, so flows, have been into BitShares ETFs, I think it's this year. I, I don't know the exact. Form. Yeah, it's, yeah, I think it's even it's even north of 30, actually. Yeah. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah, so yeah. incredible, like a fast-growing industry. Beta shares capturing a huge share of that. Like mm. if you're thinking of like, if only you could invest in beta shares, the company, right? Like it's uh, it's kind of incredible. But anyway, people now uh, have like, at least as far as I can tell in our community, like people have made the migration across the ETFs, at least mm. for part of their portfolio. Like I think in our surveys, at least eight out of 10 of our community are investing in ETFs. Um, yeah, wow. And for context, direct ASX shares would be similar, but maybe slightly less now. Mm -hmm. um, and so like people have made the migration, at least for part of their portfolio. But I'm curious from your perspective, what has changed in recent years? So it's like we don't no longer talk as much about like what is an ETF because yeah. you don't need to, but how yeah. has it changed in from where you sit and how people are treating them? Yeah, that, I think that's, that's really it. Like um, the first six or so years of the business it was it was those were the conversations um you you'd call up an advisor or you'd call up a broker this is even b before my time but um and it'd be that conversation you say hey how you going we got this new etf They're like what is an etf what is that and you have to go through this etf 101 education um process whereas where we are now almost every investor probably knows what an etf is and a lot of them have have used etfs as well so i've got that initial familiarity and i think what we're seeing now is just greater access with ETFs in terms of the strategies that are available. Mm. A really, a really interesting stat I came across the other day was because obviously, you know, the, the past year or so, fixed income has become quite topical again, just given how mm. high interest rates have gotten, the the higher return you can get on fixed income uh, securities now compared to the past decade or so. Um, and what what I found out was the last time the Australian ten year government bond yield hit five percent. Mm. which it did last month, there were zero uh, cash or fixed income ETFs available in Australia. Hmm. This time around, there was 53 uh, cash and fixed income ETFs available when the 10-year uh, yield hit 5%. And so what wow. that means is as we enter this new cycle for fixed income, as investors are now familiar with ETFs, they're much more comfortable using ETFs for that exposure. So to give you some context, the past... 12 months, we've seen $8 billion of net inflows into Australian cash and fixed income ETFs, and we've seen $12 billion of net outflows from unlisted cash and fixed income ETFs. Hmm. So I guess the, the the main psychology change we're seeing is that familiarity, that, that trust in ETFs, and then people using them for more and more parts of their portfolio. Uh, breaking the industry down, you've still got about 40% of all um, ETF money in Australia is in what I would call call core equity ETFs, ASX 200, NASDAQ 100, S&P 500. So that's still the bulk, but that's, uh, that was about 60% only five or so years ago. So mm -hmm. these other areas like fixed income, uh, like smart beta investing, If I won't go into the detail of that now, but that's a really interesting area, smart beta investing, um, things like, you know, commodities, things like currency, they're, they're taking up a lot. And thematic investing, of course, 
they take up a larger and larger amount um, of the industry as a total as people are more comfortable using ETFs uh, in different areas. Mm. It's, it's, it's more than possible, as you kind of alluded to there, to build that in, in all ETF portfolio. And the it's a democratizing move because everyone now is getting access to mm-hmm. the best of breed in index funds, thematic sector funds, um, you know, commodities, star mm-hmm. products. Like it is just, um, it's been a wonderful time to be an investor and adopt these new um, strategies as they come to market. And I guess one of the things that I'm interested, in, I'm always interested in is like the forward looking element. Now you spend a lot of time kind of like, I guess, running through different ideas, strategies, trends, um, and you're all kind of at the coal face looking at this stuff. What it is interesting to you as you look forward? Like what things are you seeing affecting maybe investment management as a whole, ETF mm-hmm. market, like positive and negative or just one or the other, whatever. Um, what are the things that you're watching? Yeah, what – so there's obviously been so much innovation in the space, which is why it's so cool to be here. One thing that I'm particularly interested in and to see how it evolves is something called direct indexing, um, which you, I'm sure you've heard yeah. of before. Some of the listeners may have as well. It's this concept of taking an index, so taking the ASX 200, and then being able to apply your own personal screens to that. So sure, there are ESG funds out there. Um, like We've got a really good, really successful suite of ESG mm. funds, but, you know, you might not mind investing in junk food companies, which we screen out or so, something like this. Um, and with direct indexing, the, the the idea is that you can take a pre-existing index, apply your own rules, and then that you have a personalised index that you can then invest in. Um, and it's becoming more accessible as we see things like, you know, free brokerage on ETFs on certain platforms. Um, it'd be remiss not to mention we we recently launched a new mm. investment platform, Beat of Shares Direct, um, and on there it's free to buy and sell ETFs. Um, and so as we get to this, you know, this race to the bottom, lower cost, um, it makes something like direct indexing become a lot more accessible. Um, because previously doing that on a large scale, if you had to do the individual brokerage um, for each individual uh, asset in the index, on a personal level, that's far too expensive. Um, if brokerage is free, well, then what's stopping you know you from constructing an index through through a you know through an advisor through an app or through you know you're not going to be doing it yourself and then that index running itself and the underlying trades going on. Um, mm. so that's a really interesting space. It's not um, too common at the moment here in Australia. In the US, I think uh, there's a bit of it going on more more tailored to the very high end uh, investors mm. for tax purposes. So they've got huge sums of money. But I wonder if we can't, uh, in in the not too distant future, make that more accessible to everyone. So I think, I think two things. I think first it would be very interesting. I think a lot of people would be excited about that. But I wonder, um, you know, so that's that's my example on ESG. So that's a bit different because you your focus might be more on the the what you're investing in rather than necessarily the returns. But it'd be interesting to see if you know if you and me are and we took the ASX 200 index and applied our own, let's say, profitability or, or debt to equity scores. Um, would we beat the market or would, uh, yeah. would the market beat us again? Um, but that's that's a really interesting space and I'm, I'm keen to keep a, keep an eye on. Yeah, it's um, really shooting the lights out direct indexing in the United States, like a rapidly growing part of the market. There's some structural differences there in the legal framework, how shares are held and accessibility and trading and that. But yeah, you're right. And um, it's kind of where you can see the industry going, at least for some investors, maybe not all investors. Um, but imagine... I'd imagine a future where some investors would like a, a chat GPT like thing that sits in front of their um, their platform where they can say, create a portfolio that only has companies that are profitable, but uses just the companies in the ASX 200. Mm-hmm. Um, and I want franking credits. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it comes up with a list and then it says, here's your basket. Um, do you want to invest or dollar cost average? And we can deduct the money. Like, that is a, in a really interesting future for a lot of people in your shoes, like it, as what you look at it at beta shares, and even from our side where we think about it, using these tools as investors. So um, it's a really interesting space, and you can see that the world kind of converging on that um, with mm-hmm. all these new tools that are coming to market. Okay, I've got final questions, just more tongue in cheek. I don't know if you have really succinct answers for these or not, mate, but that's um, 
whatever you give us is whatever I'll take. What is the finance saying that you would absolutely disagree with? Absolutely disagree with. Um, it'd have to be, I mean, he's got so many, so I'll, I'll go with I'll go with Buffett. Okay. Um, look, it, this one's contextual because the way he said it is his like it's it's right, but the way you can think about it differently is wrong. So I'll just so the quote is rule number one is to never lose money. And rule number two is never forget rule number one. And it comes a little bit back to what we talked about towards the start of, of this podcast, where I mentioned a lot of my learnings came from losing money. Um, and this idea of I think it's really good to encourage people who are younger uh, just to, to start investing in any way. Because the best way to, like you said, so like it's daunting to think about asset allocation or what's risk and what's this. The best way to start is with really young, start with a low amount and just start investing, whatever it is. Maybe just an individual company, maybe it is an ETF. Maybe it's high risk, maybe it's low risk, maybe it's a fixed income ETF. And then having some money in the game, no matter how much it is, you, you, know, you might make some, you might lose some, just your understanding and knowledge will grow so much. So I think, you know, when you're early in your journey, that's actually really important um, is to, to lose a bit of money and to, to learn why and learn how. And that'll really, I think, expand people's knowledge and understanding. Um, like I've got so many friends who keep saying, oh, they, they want to invest. I don't know what to invest into. They're scared. I'm just like, just, just. Buy anything, buy anything, get get used to that process and then, you know, learn and tweak and don't don't put your entire savings in at once, but just 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 a little bit. And it's a great way to to learn. Mm, I love that. And it's because we do take out of context. And I think context is so important, some of those sayings. And if you think the most like the golden rule is don't lose money, and then you are approaching investing, you're like, well, how do I don't lose money? Everyone seems to be losing money. And then you hear Tom and Owen say that they've lost money. Like, how does that work? Did, yeah. did they break the rule, you know? Um, and so I think that's, yeah, that's such a good one. And um, often taken out of context is Mr. Mister Buffett, like the, the never sell thing as well is um, something that, well, mm. obviously he does sell. So um, yeah. there are so many things where it's just, they might sound great and you can take them on board and the general idea is important. But I like that, mate. Um, when you come on and you can disagree with um, arguably the world's greatest ever investor um i think you 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 kind of doing something right you got conviction in your opinion so i like it mate and um if people want to learn more about uh beta shares etfs they can head to the beta shares website there'll be a link in the show notes as well as beta shares direct a new uh platform that you guys have just rolled out so that will be available there too and don't forget you can head to the insights tab of the beta shares website you can get the newsletter you can read what uh research tom and Cam and the team at BetaShares are putting out. Um, it's definitely worthwhile. There's a few different newsletters to subscribe to as well. Well, mate, this has been heaps of fun. Always good to chat. So thanks for joining me. That's awesome. Thanks so much, Alan. Catch you soon. Cheers.